Welcome to Top Rated Gym Podcast for the gym owners aiming to take their business to the next level. I'm your host, Andre, and I'm interviewing top performers, best rated, highest revenue, fastest growing gyms in the world, regardless if they have a single location or empire of thousands. If you own the gym and looking for ideas how to get more leads, increase conversion, grow your membership base, or facing troubles with customer retention, maybe your employees or operational challenges, this is is your podcast. Let's get started. Welcome everybody. Today we have incredible guests on our top rated gym podcast. I'm so excited and thrilled to have Andrew Scott, who is a co-founder and multi-unit owner of Legend Boxing. You guys are about to listen an incredible story of how Legend Boxing went from small little corner gym Jim to huge national franchise, how they did it, what can you learn from them and apply to your business? Regardless if you're a single location gym or multi, multi-unit franchise, this is for you. Andrew, welcome to the show. Andre, thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Awesome. So I'm a burning with the questions. Andrew, I want to hear your story and I want our audience to hear your story. Can you tell us in two to five minutes, I know there's like decades of experience, but you know, how everything started. Absolutely. I'm happy to go over that. So back in 2009, 2010 timeframe, to summarize it into this two to five minutes, my my former business partner and brother, Rob uh, Scott, he's also the one of the co-founders of the company. He decided he wanted to title sponsor a building. He actually owned an insurance company called XSI, which stood for Extreme Sports Insurance. And not too far away from our insurance office was a big, huge sports complex that did basketball and volleyball. And he thought it would be a really good idea to to become the title sponsor of this building and generate more leads and more business for his insurance company. Well, it, it actually did the exact opposite. Nobody had any idea it was for insurance and they all thought that it was for sports. And so the very smart businessman that my brother is, is he, he flipped with that and he decided to talk to the owners of the company and said, look, let me introduce to you guys a few different types of things that you're not doing in your gym and let me show you how I can make you some money. And so he introduced boxing, he introduced jujitsu, and then he also introduced some sort of martial art and they started running classes out of it. Well, about a year later, the coach who was the original boxing coach who had started the program, he moved out of, out of the state. And so there needed to be a new coach that came up and that was me. I volunteered. I, I presented myself as the opportunity to be this coach to turn this into a business. And so it became my full-time job. And I basically designed what happens internally in the program. So all of the workouts, the type of boxing that we coach, the punch system, the just organization and structure of how the company actually runs was created by me and then also my brother. And so that was in 2010, I officially became the full-time coach. And then in 2017, we turned into an official franchise and it's been a, it's been an amazing journey from the beginning to now. Wow. I mean, you just reminded me of my story, my friend. So you guys originally went like insurance direction and become different business. Maybe 20 years ago, me and my sister had a model agency when she was a model and we were doing work as a model agency and everybody called us to ask us not for models, but for a website, like who the heck did your website? Mm. (laughs) So, and we had more orders and asking questions about doing a website for them. That was like 20 years ago. And we shut down model agency and we become marketing company. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> so, so very similar, like damn. Yeah. And there's a story about being volunteer. You know, a lot of people ignore that factor today. How many people you know today they are willing to volunteer just because they love doing it and they didn't look nothing behind or to get out of it, and that becomes your full-time job now being involved in in a, such a brand? It's, it's not that often. Right. No, not very many. And nowadays, How especially... How old were you when you were volunteering? Oh, so I 
started boxing as a form of weight loss when I was 29 years old. Hmm. So I took over officially as the full-time coach at, I think I was probably about 30 years of age. And then I still, so I competed in boxing from 29 to 33 years of age. And then also was coaching and trying to build the business at the same time. And so through that 2009 to like 2013, that was a very long, heavy, a lot of hours, a lot of learning, a lot of coaching, a lot of boxing, a lot of training, a lot of competitive. And so during that time, it was still kind of like not a lot of advice that I can give on transitioning because I was really deep into the sure. job, working in the job. But then as we moved and, and again, like where we started, like you mentioned in the introduction, which was very nice, we started literally in the corner of a 70,000 square foot sports facility. So, so we had to build ourselves from literally a corner of the room to expanding to large enough to where we can accommodate classes of 20 people. So, so in 2014, we went independent. We went away from the sports complex and we did our own thing. We started our own legends boxing gym just in a little town in Utah called Lehigh, Utah. And then after about three years of doing that, that's when we saw, right. wow, we really have something here. We really have a product that can be duplicated. It can be expanded. And so that's when we decided to look further into the franchising world at that point. Wow, man, you, you are, you're speaking something, maybe not literally, but if I'm understanding, you didn't go into the business saying, okay, let me see which industry provides the most profit so I can get there and learn along the way. You were passionate about boxing. You were passionate about the, so much that says, okay, what do I need to do here to make this work? I'm going to volunteer. I'm going to work for free. And then, like you said, long hours, right? Once you have a love for what you're doing, when you're passionate about, you build that resilience. That nothing came as easy. Like, okay, let's just open it and everything comes in. Because 2010, full-time coach, 2014, like four years to get independence. Mm -hmm. That's called patience and hard work. And then uh, another three years to franchise. Yeah, that was, I mean... So, so 2014, that was us branching to become independent, just our own boxing gym and not having to, to yeah. fight with room anymore. And then yep. that three years, like one of the hardest tasks that my brother ever asked me to do was take the six years of boxing and boxing knowledge and coaching that you've been doing and put it down on paper, Oof. make it make it understandable for when you hand it off to someone else that this is how to run a boxing gym that was one of the biggest tasks that i've ever been put with and it took me about a year when was that happen like um it was 2017 um 2016 2017 time frame yeah and i i remember i would go coach cl classes in the morning I would come back home, I would sit in front of my computer and I would start typing and I would just, I started creating a, a coach's manual. So it was like this instructional manual on how to coach boxing classes, on how to coach the system that we provide. And it's in, and over the years since then, it has definitely expanded and it has evolved from there. But I was very proud of myself. I was very proud of a a barely graduated high school, no college education, being able to take the years of experience and put it down on paper for somebody else to be able to just enjoy it to and learn. It right. right, exactly, exactly. It's about expansion. It's about duplication. It's about so, processes. And so that was the key. And you didn't do that. Okay. Would you be able to scale without having those documents and processes? No. No, so it's black and white. It's not black. like, oh, it helped us and tipped over and kind of saved me some time. No, it's black and white. You yes. do it and you make it and you don't do it. You don't, don't make it. Well, like the biggest thing for anybody who's listening to this, especially if you're looking for expansion or even a single unit. So I, I like to live by the wing it philosophy, right? Like show up and fake it until you make it. And so for the, <laughs> right, yeah. for the first probably four years, that was what I did. I showed up, I coached a boxing class and it was fun and it was awesome. And people started loving it. And so then 
when we moved into our own location, before we became successful, like having a hundred members was great, but what what did we need to do to get to two hundred? And then what did we need to do to get to four hundred? And it took systems. It took putting things in place. It took putting strategy together. It took creating a system to follow that can be duplicated. And before we even thought of duplication, we had to create the system first. We had to create what worked and what didn't. And we did that every year. And so for anybody listening to this, one of the most successful meetings that I've ever been in which was one of our annual meetings we did as a company. It was called a SWAT meeting. It stands for SWAT, S-W-O-T. It stands for Strengths, Weaknesses, Opportunities, and Threats. And it's usually a four four or five-hour meeting, and you get all of your key personnel in the same room, and you literally just write down on paper what is working, what's not working, what is an opportunity, what is a a threat, what are strengths that we have in our company. And then by the time you are done with this meeting, you have the direction of where you are going to go for the rest of the year. You know exactly where you're headed towards Q4 and everything that you need to do in Q1, Q2, and Q3 to get you to your goal. So question, why involving team? Why wouldn't you do it by yourself? Because many people say, ah, I know it. Because I I have my ego in check, number one. I know <laughs> I can't do everything myself. Part of our success story is understanding that everything cannot be done by itself, that you have to have the right key people in place to get the jobs done. Where I excel, like prime example, I have three current operating locations right now that are all profiting. They all make a profit, and I'm very proud of that but I cannot do that by myself. And so where my strengths are is in coaching and supporting of my coaches. My strengths are not managing a CRM and managing spreadsheets and managing sales and leads and that kinds of stuff. That's not my strength. So I hire somebody who where that is their strength. So Mm -hmm. I can focus in my lane, they can focus in their lane and we're both driving in the same direction. And as long as we're doing our jobs in the same direction, we're all going to meet the same goal at the end of it. And that's how I live and have always lived. I've had to learn that. Like I I will be the first to admit that especially early on in my coaching career, I had to very much learn. I can't do it myself. That I, I have to delegate. I have to trust people, people to do the job for me. Just like that. Exactly that. That is exactly and then, it. Streaming in yes. The that is exactly it. That's exactly it. We're speaking the exact same language. No doubt. So I was uh, referring to the book, if you're listening, what the heck is US? is It's process-oriented book. Why people and companies get stuck and never go over the certain level. And this, you're literally pitching the book about how to implement processes and take it to the next level. Well, man, and I, I, I know the answer about SWAT and, and, and the reason why I ask a question, because when you get your team involved, you also get more ideas than yourself. Second, mm-hmm. when the decisions are made mutually, you have a buy-in. You don't need to yeah. sell them on it. You don't need to go to the team and say, this is how we do it, and they get resistance. Yeah. Everybody says, okay, we all agree. We all did listen. Maybe we disagree, but we agree after the outcome. This is where we're going. And they all commit. They call it disagree, but commit. Because some of the people were pulling this direction. And they had to move and move forward. So point taken. Another book that I would recommend is this one. I don't know if you see it on the screen called... Extreme Revenue Growth. Extreme Mm -hmm. Revenue Growth. And word process... Is mentioned probably 600 times. <laughs> I mean, I'm real. <laughs> if you don't have it, it just doesn't come. It, it has to be. There's one way to make a Big Mac. You can't take the middle bun out of a Big Mac just because you decide it doesn't fit there. There's a process for it. And the process being done the way is go, has been proven to take mm-hmm. you to success. Like, right. It's, and that's like to me, that's why people go into franchising. Like yeah. we've already discovered all of the problems. We've already ironed out the the hiccups and the things that don't work. We are identifying what does work. So when you follow the process and the system, 
then you get to the goal you're looking for when you initially started even starting franchising. <clears throat> Got it. So let's refer to any other problem. Gym owner can say, I have a problem with employee. Is it really employee problem or process problem? It could be it both. Process? Can it be could both. be both. It could be definitely be both. Um, and uh, can be more on a process. And I'm saying why, because I, I was totally it's employee problem. How you hire, how you train, how you evaluate, how you fire. It's all process. That is, yeah, well, then yes, you're right. It's on both <laughs> of so, so yeah, you're right. Now taking yourself and you, you're correct by hiring somebody, training them correctly, following through and making sure that they're doing their job, verifying that it's being done is part of process, absolutely. And but them knowing still, that they're part of the process. If you don't have a process, they don't know how to behave. That's true. That, and now they're winging it and they're off trying to figure out what they think is going to be the best thing. And then most of the times that doesn't align with what the owner or the boss thinks is the best things. And so, so yes, no, absolutely correct. Having those processes in place for yourself as far as an employer is going to benefit you on your employees knowing yeah. like the last phrase you said, how to fire, right? Like if they're not doing the job, it's, and we all yeah. delay on that process. Right. Yeah. Most of us. I don't have any big problem with that. But luckily, I have a great team of people that right now my job has gone mostly into the support of my team. So the way I kind of go about my day to day is that I work for my employees. They don't work for me. And I am in this to support them. So Again, as a business owner, I can't expect my employees to take the same kind of passion and pride in my business. They don't own it. They don't have any equity in it. They didn't put any risk involved into the business. So I can't put that on them to expect them to act and think like an owner. No, I expect you to do the job that I hired you for, that we shook hands and wrote a contract and signed a contract. I expect that from you. And if what I can do is support you in your job and making your job easier, then I'm doing my job and we're all going to get to the same goal together. See what I found, Andrew, very interesting. Recently, our company hired a chief operating officer, person who's coming from 60,000 people company, Six Sigma Black Belt, like middle name process, mm -hmm. honestly. And things totally change. And the things I complain about, vendors, like advertising agencies, like they suck. Sorry, my French, like nobody's good enough. I was complaining about industry and vendors instead of complaining about process. Because all the time I come on a demo, I see the product, I like it, I don't like it. I think my mind based on limited information, trust it or don't trust it. Now we have a little process. If you structure a process says, I, I got burned in the past, this is how I don't get burned. You either deliver or not, there's no middle ground. Love the process. Going further from there, what do you see next? What is the next in your stage? We know how what got you here, but where do you, where is 10 years from now? We are in 2034 oh, wow. now. I love that question. And as a matter of fact, so one of the things that Legends prides ourselves on is never having a ceiling. Okay. We don't place a ceiling on top of ourselves that we're always breaking to the next level. We're always trying to be innovative to the industry. We, we actually like to separate ourselves from the industry where we are very unique to the boxing industry and we stand alone. And so really the sky is the limit for me personally. I'm in my 10 year plan right now where I see myself, I, I see it every single day. I envision it every day. I have I can smell the sand. I can smell the salt in the air. And it is Costa Rica and Ooh. Portugal and retirement. That's my 10-year plan. So Whoa. my personal 10-year plan, I have my three operating locations right now. They're all in Utah. They're in just three different cities in Utah. One of them is in a, a city called Orem. Another one is in a city called Bountiful. And then the other one is another one called West Jordan. I am in the process right now. I've narrowed down my location to two different locations that I'm opening up my fourth location in a city called Ogden. And then in a year, I will open up my fifth location in a city called Spanish Fork. And then in an, another year and a half to two years from that, 
we will open up another one in a city called Provo. So I'll have six locations operating mm-hmm. that look very enticing to somebody who wants to come in and buy a large scale fitness gym on multiple levels. And I will sell my equity and me and my wife will retire and we'll move out of the country and we'll enjoy the rest of our lives together. And so that's what I see in 10 years from now. And so in eight years, that's my goal is to get all of those locations open and at, to a profit center. That's American dream. One thing that I heard over and over for people who accomplished the same thing, they went back to do something. <laughs> so, well, that doesn't mean I'm not going to open up a boxing gym in Costa Rica or Portugal. <laughs> so, it just no, means you have buddies uh, yeah. working out with me, right? Exactly. Yes, I, I still be staying in shape. I still like again. It's like you said. I started this because of my passion. It it, mm. it was never something that I ever thought was going to be financially lucrative for me or was going to turn into a full-time career. I was a mechanic. I I grew up in California and I started working on cars when I was 15 years old. And I worked all the way through until the 2008 economy crashed really hard and I had to move out of California. And that's when I found boxing and boxing, Mm. just the sport and the stuff that I had to put myself through it changed who I was as a person. It changed yes. my perspective on life. Development, internal. And external. Yes, it, it, it gave me you the had confidence to become more. I could do this. Yes. And now I look back on it and go, it was the best thing that I ever did. And so mm. I'm still driven by passion. I'm driven mm. by what I love to do. I'm not really motivated by money. My philosophy is the money's going to come. Money's going to come and go. But if I can maintain my passion and my love for what it is that I'm doing, then I'm going to be rewarded for that financially. And I have been, and I'm very blessed to be where I currently am. And Andrew, a lot of people are resistant to change, quite frankly. And even if you tell them you have to change in order to become business owner, they're like, no, I don't want to change. And I think interpretation of the word change is different. I would more likely say you become more. Mm -hmm. You expanded your identity. You got tapped into the areas of your life you never thought you will be able to do it. And because of demand, because of you have to do something for somebody. You have to be something for somebody. You know, you can be in a bad mood by yourself, and then you have to show up on a meeting in front of the team, in front of the client, and then you kind of put your superhero suits, and then you deliver. Mm-hmm. And just the fact of having to act a certain way in front of the certain people change your biochemistry and makes you feel better. I was like, okay, now did I change, did I fake, or I learn how to behave? All I learned how to control my emotions, my physics, my state. I was like, thank you, God, for giving me all these challenges. So I have to be, you know, when the kids, you can't complain, I cannot take the kids. If the kid is, you know, in the trouble, like you do what has to be done at that right. moment. And that changed the bar of what you're capable of. That's the personal development that only only comes with the, with the challenges, with the effort, with the need to be more for somebody else, not just yourself. You know, and I, I'm glad you actually said that and touched on that because that reminded me that sometimes it's not us that realizes the change that needs to happen. It's somebody else that educates us in the change that we need to see in ourselves. And a mm. quick story on that is years ago, remember, like we've gone through years of development and process to create the systems that we have now. And In my own world, being the only coach, there was nobody else. It was just me. And it took someone pulling me aside and going, Andrew, you are a phenomenal coach, but I have sat there and listened to you for this entire hour. And not one time did you ever compliment a single person on what they're doing. All you've done is focused on the correction that they need to improve on. But while they're doing that, there's 10 different things they're doing really good rather than the one correction. And so I sat back and I really thought about that. And I really went, you know what? Critic well taken. They're absolutely right. I am. I need to enforce more positivity in what they're doing. This is a very difficult sport. This is a very difficult And if you thing. don't do that, they don't know what works and they'll keep yes. on being frustrated. And they're never going to feel like they're getting better. 
ever. But what it did is it changed me as a person. Mm. It changed my perspective. It changed how I present myself in the class. Now I'm looking more at the positive mm. rather than the negative. So that in turn transitioned to everything else I do in life. I, even the way I drive, I'm not, I don't have even have as much road rage just because I'm looking at more of the positive things just because of that, of, of changing the way I coach. So now Looking that the angle, like what's yes, good about this, not what's exactly. bad about this. Exactly. So now in coaching training, when I'm training another coach, part of our training is what's called constructive criticism. We have to give two compliments before making any correction. Okay. And that's when I and tell by my way, coach, that's called process. Yes, it's called process. So it's a part of our process. So part of that is reinforcing that positivity in someone's life. And it just changes the whole dynamic of the environment of the gym and everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that reflects on how you deal with the family, with the kids, with the wife. We yes. can always look at what's wrong. But I like a question. What's good about this? You know, even if the worst thing happening, there's nothing good. If you ask yourself a question, what's good about what just happened? And you keep asking questions, you might find some good answers. Mm -hmm. I remember, you know, we have hacking attack decade ago and really almost take, took us down. I was like, oh, this was survival moment. And my team says, oh my God, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? I'm like, okay, let's start with a question. What's good about this? Nothing is good about it. There's a damage being done. There's money being uh, out. Like, there's nothing good about it. No, no, no. Let's ask ourselves a question. 10 years from now, what's good about this? I was like, okay, now we learned a lesson. Okay, now we know how to change things. Now we know how to implement process so this never happened again. I was like, look at this. How, what, how many good lessons we got from this in everything? Just a little, little different angle. Interesting, my friend. And, and uh, this is a lesson for not only owning a gym, it's about private life. Life in general. It's life in general. Mm -hmm. you know and and, and how we approach we i think you know like again it, it the difference in my opinion is like when we were younger we didn't have the world at the palm of our hand right we didn't have the negativity we didn't have the stuff like it's not like when we were kids that bad stuff wasn't happening we just didn't have it readily available at our fingertips every second of the day. Yeah. And so now that we do have it readily available, uh, unfortunately, I think the mass majority of people have just, they just don't like each other anymore. They, we, you, you were just, we're, we're angry at each other. We're mad. We're constantly frustrated at people and doing these types of practices, thinking more of what's the good that we see here in this I think brings us back to bringing together a community. It brings back together people. It brings the, you know, the camaraderie that we have just as sharing the fact that we're human beings. And so I suggest everybody look, whoever's listening to this, go look in the mirror and deep down inside and how, how thought processes your brain of negativity versus compassion and happiness and joy and the things that you see around and the gratitude you have for the stuff that's in your life. And mm -hmm. if we just kind of sometimes step back and kind of see that and look yeah. at it from those kinds of lenses, we can see how, how blessed we really are and how much right. we do really have in life. Change expectations with appreciations. Yes. And your life will change totally. Just start appreciating. There's always good in something. There we go. I don't know. It's kind of blurry. Okay. There we go. Look at that. Talking about positivity. Positivity always wins. <laughs> that is freaking awesome. So, man, they call it resilience. If you don't have positive mind, you will really crash. You got to look for, from the brighter side, no matter what. One of the, I want to talk about uh, challenges now. There is the challenges that you went through the career and some of them are smaller, some of them bigger. Right. What is your approach? Like, can you name one challenge that, that really tested your ability, <laughs> tested your limits? How did you go uh, through? What did you learn? You know, and, and maybe it's current challenge. Maybe it's something you're dealing now. I can think of a few different challenges, but in, and to be completely honest with you, I've always looked at challenges as the same way as building a bicep muscle, right? The, the more I 
I walk through a challenge or see a challenge go away because I accomplished it. Or the more I look at something as a learning experience, I'm always succeeding. So I'm not really seeing these challenges. And so the more challenges that I presented and have accomplished and worked myself through, the more my bicep muscle is getting bigger. So I'm working it just mm -hmm. like it is. So now it's almost like I don't look at it as a challenge. I look at it as, as just something to solve. COVID small. was a big one coming out to COVID us. COVID was out huge. Of, it was huge. Of. But to be honest with you, so during that time, the business had gone a couple of different directions. There was a larger company that had done an acquisition for us. And so it was being overseen and run by a larger uh, franchise mm -hmm. company that was based out of Philadelphia. And so during that time of COVID, like, yes, there were a lot of challenges that were being presented, but at a company level, it was being handled by this bigger, larger company. The challenge that I was presented with was how do we keep the doors from closing? And mm. that was a big challenge. But I remember it like, again, the point I'm making is that I don't sit and dwell on the fact that it's a challenge. I immediately start trying to figure out a solution. Yes. So I, I remember being on a Zoom call with all the head honchos of the company and they're going, okay, it looks like the government's going to force us to shut down and we're going to have to close our doors. What are we going to do to save our company? And I said, it's simple. We're going to figure out how to take Legends Boxing and put it in at your home. We're going to turn these from in-class workouts to at-home workouts. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be really online good. and it's going to be virtual and people are going to have an option to pay half of their membership so they can opt in and still be a part of this company. Well, we did that. And through the entire duration of COVID, mm -hmm. we were in the top 10 of all franchises for member retention. We retained mm -hmm. over 80% of our membership throughout all of COVID and we're only shut down. Now, again, it was state by state. And so sure. certain states had to be shut down longer than other states, but Utah we were only shut down for about three months. And so we were able to bounce back pretty well and get our gyms back up. And, and it was, again, we had to change our procedures. We had to change our policies to mm. make it a safe environment for people to come in and, and participate during COVID. But we saw the challenge and we figured out a solution to it. We didn't waste time worried about whether or not we were going to make this work. We just made it work and that's how we've kind of always dealt with everything we just make it work well you know i speak with the gym owners all the time and everybody is focusing one thing like how do i get more members you're right what works how do i get more leads and i believe one of the key elements on getting more members is preventing losing existing members because people says okay they lost i need to make one get a new one to replace the one that's lost. So I need to spend the money on ads, spend on conversion, call them, talk to them, treat them, get them in. It's a lot of work. Instead of thinking about retention, like retaining one member, it's like getting two, honestly, because it's the guy who already get training, knows less work for the team, less work for, for you. We just need to figure out what works the best in retaining. So I would love, if you don't mind, just kind of, Brainstorming a little bit, like what did you find in retention today, not COVID? That is key element. Do you have anything in process for your for your gym that you look like exit surveys, understanding, prevention, members at risk, any of these elements that that helps you minimize the the leaky bucket? Mm -hmm. So a couple of things. Number one, we're a skills based program, so we're not just teaching workouts we're actually teaching the skills of boxing so learning a skill set where you're seeing progression and you're seeing yourself get better that's a retention tool in itself just right there mm -hmm. so if you're constantly making someone feel like they're learning they're getting better and they're targeting their goals that will retain them number one so we do that first and foremost but number two, a yeah, internal process that we have, what we call in our company, it's called a seven and 90. And so what we do is we do seven touches in 90 days. So mm -hmm. when someone signs up, we go through this process where the first month they're getting a 
a personal text message or a thank you card that we send them. That's a handwritten thank you card to mm-hmm. let them know how much we appreciate them being a part of our gym. We go through even more where they'll get an email that gives them discounts to pro shops. It invites a met for them to be able to bring a friend to come to class, right? So there's these seven specific steps that they go through mm-hmm. throughout that 90 day process. Because what we've found is most of your members within the first three months will fall off. Okay? So if you want to retain them after three months, using this process, actually what that does is it coincides with our first core value, which our first core value is belong. So you are a part belong? of- Belong? Yeah, belong. You're a part of a community. Mm-hmm. You're a part mm-hmm. of a tribe. And we want you to feel that way. We want you to feel like- Well, you're not just a number on a spreadsheet to us. You are a human being. You have a name, you have a family, you have a life, and we want to know about that life. And so getting to know that person and making them feel a part of that community is a part of our retention piece also. For example, every one of my friends and current individuals that I associate with, they are current and or at one point were a Legends Boxing member. And Mm. that's most of everybody that I associate with. And they know that I am authentic. I am real. I'm not blowing the smoke up their ass. I am literally your friend and I am here for your best interests. I want to help Mm. you achieve your goals and what it is that you walked into my gym for. So we kind of separate, like I said, we are, we separate ourselves from the industry, from boutique Mm. fitness and from boxing we are our own independent source of whatever you're looking for. Wow. And and that's kind of what we pride ourselves on. I want to comment on that. First one you says is skill-based workout. Right. Uh, probably do you have some kind of system on, in place, like martial art has all these belts. That's a one way. Right. And that keeps people like, ah, there's another level. Mm-hmm. You know, for me, life is the game with infinite number of levels. And this is the, same thing you do in your business and and people will appreciate people will always look up for the next level absolutely whoa where did you get that idea i mean is it like part of the of the boxing community as well no or no in fact as a manager or a leader i have just always gone back and i've taken all of the leaders and managers i've had in my life growing up and Mm -hmm. i take all of the bad qualities that i didn't like And I get rid of them and I take all the good qualities that I really did like and I absorb them. And then I mold them to my type of personality and that's the type of leader that I am. So I would say my worst quality as a leader is that I'm not a micromanager. Mm -hmm. The way I lead is that I trust, but yet I verify. And and the, the way I look at it is that it's my job to give you the tools to be successful at your job. And if I don't do that, then I've failed at my job. Mm, so that's where I constantly, are you working for me or am I working for you? And if I'm working for you and giving you all the tools that are necessary to effectively do your job at the best, then I'm going to win. My company is going to see where it needs Mm -hmm. to go. You're going to see where you need to go. I'm going to have advancement opportunity for you. So you're never going to be plateaued in the same job position. Because if my company keeps expanding, the opportunity for you to expand with the company is there. And that's how I hire everybody. I don't ever hire anybody without the expectations that there is a possibility for growth there is Mm -hmm. a possibility for more income and there is a possibility for you to go as high as you want in the ceiling and that Mm -hmm. if ever that chance is not there then it's because i'm not in business and so that's where i've also learned you can't take everybody on your on their word. And so mm-hmm. you have to let their actions speak for themselves a lot of the mm-hmm. times. Um, so when I do a hiring process, it is always in a probationary period. Yes. I hire everybody with a 90-day probation period with the opportunity to show me that you are worth what it is that I'm willing so to pay you. If they don't check off all the boxes, you don't fire them. They just don't continue in the next set. Next exactly. level. Exactly. Or I utilize the good qualities of the things that they're doing. 
and I put a different role on them or I put a different like, you know, now you're no longer this, you're going to work as this and you're going to continue to do mm -hmm. these areas that you excel in, right? Yeah. And I find somebody else to take over the other responsibilities that they can excel in. So yeah. I'm never, I'm never like, again, I'm quick to fire. I'm quick to change. I'm not, I'm not quick to just sit there and hold on to money going down the toilet, but mm -hmm. I am also someone that is willing to give people an opportunity, yeah. right? I'm going to let you either succeed or fail on your own. And yeah. where I can sleep easy is knowing I've given you all of the tools to be successful. And if you still can't be successful at your job when I've given you all the tools, well, then I need to find somebody else who's willing to be successful at it. So that's just kind of how my process goes. And it right. also gives me the opportunity in that 90 days to evaluate this person. But it's also, again, I, I make it very clear to my employee, mm -hmm. this is a two-way evaluation. Okay, yes. Just because yes. you start the job now and you're excited doesn't mean 90 days from now, you're still going to love the job and you're still going to be excited. So I it gives both of us an opportunity to understand if this is something we want to continue doing. That's right. It's like trial period, like dating right. before the marriage. Let's, mm -hmm. let's start figuring out testing. Is there anything you guys are doing? Like, how do you know if you're doing a good job in retention? Do you measure it? Do you see it by... Yeah by numbers? Do you go into your booking system and like, wh what's your metrics that you look at? Yeah. So, so our KPI metrics that we're constantly looking over is we have quality of lead. So it, it's usually measured on how many leads are coming in through our CRM, how many are actually showing up to a free trial class, how many of those we're able to get a hold of. So it, it basically, it starts from initial contact, right? How many contacts are we able to make? How many are we able to get a hold of? How many are we able to book as a free class? How many of those trials showed up to their trial? How many of those trials stayed and talked to someone after class and then turned into a member? How many of those members stayed beyond a certain number of months? So, so we are really, our KPI, our spreadsheet's actually pretty large as far mm -hmm. as the different metrics that we're tracking. And what that helps us to be able to do is it helps us look at a uh, variable different things. Is it a sales problem? Is it a procedure problem? Is it a process problem? Mm. Is it a lead problem? Is it a cost problem? Like mm. it, it really helps us to be able to identify, do I have the key people in place? Are they hitting my metrics that I'm mm. looking for? Is my benchmark being hit, right? Like I can see just from looking over month, over month, over month, mm what my area and issue is. And so without these metrics, we would kind of be just swimming in the dark and kind of not understanding. We'd always be kind of like just trying and never knowing this is the procedure that works. If you do this, if you do this, and if you do this, these are the numbers you're sure. going to see. And this is what you're going to get at the end of it. And you just mentioned, I just want to confirm, how often do you look at the numbers? Uh, weekly. It's weekly. A, it, in our industry, it changes week over week. Mm. It's not, and, and it's not like a quarter after quarter thing. Like I'm looking over numbers and meeting with my staff sometimes mm. twice a week. I'm looking over numbers guaranteed every single week because I can look at those numbers and kind of get a projection of how the rest of the month is going to go. Or mm. I can look at the beginning of the month and see what we can adjust, switch, change, or alter to try to get a good end of the month. So, so yeah, I'm yeah. I'm constantly looking over our metrics. I'm constantly the, looking over our, our spreadsheet. The more in trouble you are, the more often you need to watch. So I, I remember hearing a story from Chase Bank when the economy shifting, they went from once a month meeting about numbers to once a week to once a day, and now twice to three times a day. Is like how many, how quickly iterations you can make, how many iterations you can do if you're measuring twice a day, you have four, 20 days, you can do 40 plus iterations versus you go month and you wait another month to see iterations. Like change is everything in dynamic role. Oh my God, there's so many good good stuff, man. I, I'm, I'm blessed to have you here. So what we want to do is wrap up with a quick turbo questions. Like this is literally one sentence answer. I'm going to ask it. First thing that comes on your mind, you just shoot it out, right? Okay. You have no clue what I'm going to have to ask, but first brain reaction. 
So first one, I want you to name two people you would like to recommend to be on a podcast. Either people you would like to learn from or people that have a good value, either success to share with the audience. Um, absolutely. So I, I, my first person, I would actually have to recommend my brother, Rob yeah. Scott. Definitely. It's not just with legends. He actually is an entrepreneur of, I think, 11 different businesses, legends just being one of them. And he is, he is constantly foot down on the gas pedal all the time. So the stuff he can teach people, the experiences he's had in life would be invaluable to so many people. The second person that I would recommend is his name is actually Nico Pesci. He's one of my very good friends. He's also one of my former legends member. He is his own business owner. He's in the financial industry, but for 55 and older retirement individuals. And so he, his processes and his development over the years of where his business has become very successful, mm -hmm. he would also be a very invaluable person to talk to. Whoa. Nico Pesci. Awesome. H. Good one. Leaders are learners. Do you have any recommended book podcast that made an impact? Yes. Like the biggest book I would have to say that made a huge impact on me. Um, it was audio. I'm in my car 33,000 miles a year. So I do audio books <laughs> and his name was Gary Lloyd Bishop. And the name of the book was, excuse my language, but it was Unfuck Yourself. Was the oh, I, I know. I listened to it, but uh, yeah, Unfuckable. <laughs> yes, I, I, I really, that was, you know, again, just the most of the book is derived off of self-talk and it really put a lot of different perspectives for my own self-talk. And yeah. once I started just rechanging the way I perceive things and the way I speak to myself up here, it changed yes. everything about my life. <laughs> I have it in my audio library. Same thing, University on the Wheels, guys. If you don't have time to read the books, don't read it. Listen it. Anytime I walk the dog, anytime I go to the gym, anytime I go out, just plug yourself, put, put it out. Awesome. Last question. Is there any place where you love to go, like conferences or either online sources that is inspiring for people to go and look for the more information? So... We do a lot of our own conferencing and we do a lot of our own like clinics. And so mm. I really enjoy being a part of those, listening to different perspectives, different experiences from our internal ownership group. Mm. I do, there was a, a, a while ago where I didn't go to the meetings, but I was able to take benefit of learning about the meetings and talking and rubbing shoulders. It was called EO, it was called Entrepreneurs Organization. Yes. And I knew probably about five or six of these high level entrepreneur executives that would go to these EO meetings. And then I had the opportunity to pick their brains and talk to them and rub shoulders with them. And so the stuff that I've learned just in conversation has been yeah. invaluable to me, but yeah, at Legends, the community we, of the successful yeah. people, you got to be vetted by, by the group. You got to participate. It's not selling. It's all about contribution. It's very Absolutely. Good. Absolutely. Couldn't said it better. Wow. Man, we're wrapping up on Top Rated Gym. One and only Andrew with Legend Boxing. Andrew, what can I say? I appreciate every word of wisdom you shared with us today. It's incredible golden nuggets. Now mm -hmm. we understand what's behind Legends and, and, and the name really you carry it. I got to say, give you that. Appreciate it, uh, you attending to our podcast today and for your time and for chatting with us. Is there any way that somebody can connect with you, reach out, LinkedIn, contacts, and so on? Because there are people who might join your mission. There are people who want to say, damn, this is the place I want to be part of it. Maybe employee, maybe investors, maybe future franchises, partners. So uh, I'll include your contact information in the description of the podcast. So be on the lookout. Andrew, once again, you're amazing. Thank you for participation. Thank you so very much for having me. It has been such a pleasure. Good to have you. Wow, what an episode, right? Thank you guys for tuning in into this Top Rated Gym podcast. We hope you found valuable insights and practical tips to help you tackle the challenges of gym ownership. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on your favorite platform. We want to reach the community. With your help, we can be the biggest contributor, biggest resources for you and other gym owners. 
don't forget to follow us on social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all of them, YouTube. If you have any questions, feedback, or topics you would like us to cover, or people you would like us to interview, or if you want to be interviewed on the podcast, reach out at topratedgym.com. Stay tuned, stay motivated, keep pushing your gym to the top. Until next time, this is Andre signing off. Bye.